In these next set of videos, I'm going to be conducting uh, some video responses to Rabbi Osher Mazer's video, Errors in the New Testament Consider Judaism, and it's my fond hope to respond to some of the claims that he makes in his video. Let us begin. Hi, my name is Osher Mazer. Today I, a plain Jew, will explain why I don't accept Jesus or Yeshua as the Messiah and why you shouldn't either. The ultimate purpose of this video is to sanctify HaKadosh Baruch Hu by making his name known among the nations. That, my friends, is one of the main reasons for Israel being appointed. Did you know that the word Jew comes from the word Yehuda, which means to give praise? Now, what does that mean to give praise? Does that mean to retire into piety while this world self-destructs? No. The word actually means to testify, to be a witness, to stand before humanity and spread ethical monotheism to the ends of the earth. That's what it means to be a Jew, my friends. Let me give you a quick synopsis of the Jewish people, because this is very important. So listen carefully. Our father Abraham first chose God. God, in turn, returned the favor by appointing Abraham and his descendants to be his holy mouthpiece to the world. He equipped us on Mount Sinai for his holy death by giving us his moral blueprint for humanity, his Torah, so that everyone who acts on his instructions would be blessed and have a share in transforming this world to its final messianic stage which will be ruled by the righteous seed of David, the Messiah. On this basis, the Almighty made an everlasting covenant with the people of Israel that by definition can never be broken. My friends, envision it. One God, one people, made up of all races. What an earth-shaking idea. It all began with Abraham, the first convert. Today, you can also decide to join the people of Israel through conversion. As it says in Takuma Lechacha, that Reish Lecha said, that a convert is dearer to the Creator than a born Jew, my friends. Join us. Now that's sound theology. In this video, I will explain how Christians have twisted this idea. How they took the concept of a loving creator who requires obedience over sacrifice, goodness and repentance over blood atonement. They verbally strip the Almighty of true mercy and justice and make him similar to pagan bloodthirsty gods of old. That's the first claim. I let the uh, video play for a while because I wanted you, you guys to hear the introduction. But it's interesting. Uh, notice what he said. You know, change. Well, actually, let's play it again so I don't misrepresent him. In this video, I will explain how Christians have twisted this idea. How they took the concept of a loving creator who requires obedience over sacrifice, goodness, and repentance over blood atonement. They verbally strip the Almighty of true mercy and justice and make him similar some pagan, bloodthirsty gods of old. That is the first claim that Rabbi Ashamazer makes, and it's an unfounded claim. Let me straighten this out right now. No Christian who reads the Bible denies repentance, or God's mercy, or his fairness, or his love. No Christian denies that. No Christian downplays that. I'm talking about true Christians who know what the Bible says. They do not downplay any of those things. The point that Christians make is that because God is a holy God, he requires atonement. He requires life to be shed when you sin. That is why he set up the sacrificial system in the first place. That's the first point one of the first things to consider. Christians are not guilty of turning Hashem into a bloodthirsty pagan monster, which is what Hashem seems to be asserting here. And yeah, while in the scripture, he prefer 
it's better to it, while it is true in the scripture that obedience is better than sacrifice that is very true that doesn't mean that you uh, that sacrifice is to be downplayed that doesn't mean that at all that's uh, another thing i need to just quickly throw in there carry on their so-called new testament claims that god has done away with his instructions for morality. One can only imagine how that statement would have been understood by Jews of old. They would have fallen to the ground and yelled, with all their might, God forbid. Yes, my friends, God forbid. As long as I have breath in my lungs, I will proclaim truth. The truth of Torah to both Jews and Gentiles. It is the Christian claim that Jesus came to fulfill the Torah. The Torah. That's the claim we make. Under the New Covenant, in Christian theology, Gentiles are not required to keep certain aspects of the law, namely food laws, ceremonial distinctions, the subject of um, uh, dealing with menstrual period or um, emission of semen or so the ceremonial distinctions are not there in the New Testament they were fulfilled by Christ same with the Sabbath day and the sacrifices that's the Christian claim you Jews who accept Jesus can keep the Torah if they so choose not to get saved but to um if they feel it honors the Messiah to keep certain aspects of the Torah, that's up to them. That is up to them entirely. But they are not allowed to force Gentiles to go under that conviction. That's very important. Paul even calls the law good. But he also makes it clear that one is not saved or justified by it. Actually means instructions and teachings. He's actually correct on that point. You can translate Torah as instruction. So that's a correct point Ashamesa makes. <coughs> a Jew of old would have known that no Torah equals no purpose, and no purpose equals imminent doom. Christians claim that because the Jewish people did not receive Jesus as the Messiah when he appeared on the scene, God has turned his back on them. That's why it's so important that you don't miss not one minute of this lecture. Let us get one thing straight. The New Testament itself does not claim that the Jews have been abandoned by God. Quite to the contrary, Paul says that God still loves the Jews and wants to restore the Jews. You can also f you can find in the book of Romans that his heart's desires for his own people and that the covenants, plural, referring to the Old and the New Testament, the covenant to the covenants, sorry, to the Jews belongs the covenants. This can be found in Romans 9. I shall read a section of it for you. Romans 9 1 to 5 quote i speak the truth in christ i'm not lying my conscience confirms it through the holy spirit i have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart for i wish that i myself were cursed and cut off from israel for the sake of my people those of my own race the people of israel theirs is the adoption to sonship theirs is the divine glory the covenants plural the receiving of the law the temple worship and the promises, theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is tra traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. Unquote. There's more I could read in the section of Romans 9 to 11 that demonstrates that the idea that God has abandoned the Jews because of their rejection of the Messiah is sheer folly. Replacement theology is not in the scripture of the New Testament, nor is it even in the Old Testament. This can be found in Leviticus 26, 40 to 44. 
or 45, rather. It says, quote, But if they, the Israelites, will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors, their unfaithfulness and their hostility towards me, which made me hostile towards them, so that I sent them into the land of their enemies, then when their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they pay for their sin, I'll remember my covenant with Jacob, and my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham, and I will rem remember the land. For the land will be deserted by them and will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. They will pay for their sins because they rejected my laws and abhorred my decrees. Yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them or abhor them so as to destroy them completely, breaking my covenant with them. I am the Lord their God. But for, for their sake, I will remember the covenant with their ancestors whom I brought out of Egypt in the sight of the nations to be their God. I am the Lord. Unquote. Hashem makes it very clear in the text that in spite of the Jews' rebellion, he will, he will make sure that he'll preserve the people and make sure he does not break the covenant. Remember this, the validity of a covenant does not depend on man's faithfulness, it depends on God's faithfulness. That is another important point to bring to the table. Plus also Jeremiah 31.31, 31, which I have referenced in a previous response to Rabbi Asher Meza, makes it very clear that the new covenant was not made with the church, but it was in fact made with the Jews. And you can go and watch that video where I talk on this issue more in depth. There are also two sections from Romans 11 I want to present to the table as well. Namely, verses 1 to 3. Quote, I asked then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Unquote. That's verses 11 to 4. And of course, I direct you to verses um, 28 to 32 in the same context. This is what it says, quote, As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. Referring to Israel, those who den or the people in Israel who deny Christ. But as far as the election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs, for God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Just as you were, who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience. So they too have now become disobedient in order that may, they too may now have mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all, unquote. Even in this context, it makes it very clear that the promises of God given to the Jewish people go forth without repentance. Now let me preface one clear point. Despite what I have said, in this video, that does not mean that the Jews will be saved without Jesus. Dual covenant theology is a heresy, no question about that. Jews need the gospel to be saved. They are cho God's chosen people, even in unbelief, but that doesn't mean they'll be saved without Christ. That is very important, and people like John Hagee should stop teaching this error. Because it is very, very poisonous. And lastly, with respect to this point, if you want to make an issue about Romans 2, I have written an article on this which I can also post in the description below for you to read. Let us continue, shall we? You must hang on in every word and ultimately decide for yourselves. The title of this lecture is Christian Scriptural Errors. My dear friends, I will begin this battle by disproving the foundation of Christianity, which is what they call the New Covenant or New Testament, as the false and erroneous book that it is, so that you can ultimately become a fool to yourself. And the only weapons I will use to accomplish this task 
is the unchangeable word of God, the Tanakh. What Christians so erroneously call the Old Testament and the Christian New Testament itself. Now, my friend, time is limited, so please pay attention because I'll be moving fast. The first book of the New Testament is the Gospel of Matthew. How do we know it's written by Matthew? Well, we don't. It was ultimately the Roman Catholic Church that decided who wrote the books of the New Testament, and they also decided which books to include in the Christian canon. Yes, my friends, the Catholic Church, the same church that Protestants claim is the great whore of Babylon spoken of in the book of Revelation, had the task of combining and compiling what works they considered holy and ultimately scripture. It's beneficial for you to know that the Catholic Church, in choosing the books of the New Testament, actually tossed out other gospels or accounts they did not think fit to. Why? Because I will show you that the church was not interested in truth or authenticity, but rather propaganda to fill their pagan agendas. You're saying, Asher, sure. that's a loaded statement. Well, stay tuned and I'll back it up. Okay. Simple factual errors. One, Roman Catholicism never gave us the Bible. That's the first point. Secondly, if he's saying that the Roman Catholic Church, he doesn't mention this explicitly in the video, by the way, but I've assumed and inferred that he is referring to the Council of Nicaea. Let me be clear on this. The Council of Nicaea never address the canon of the scripture. They never addressed it. What they did address was the Arian heresy, Gnosticism, the date of celebrating Easter, and they also dealt with canon laws and other things. But not once did they ever discuss the canon at Nicaea. There were councils before that did discuss the canon, and it had evolved on its own. There were uh, there was a, some council, um, a council after Nicaea, a council known as the Council of Carthage, which finalized the canon of the New Testament. There there is no evidence that the Council of Nicaea ever addressed the canon of the Scripture, and there is no evidence that Roman Catholicism ever gave us the canon of Scripture. And of course, Keith Thompson has recently done a documentary on Roman Catholicism. That is something I re uh, recommend checking out. It's about it's about eight hours, but um, I think you can squeeze a little bit each day, just dedicating at least an hour or half hour to watching it each day. But anyway, Roman Catholicism and Nicaea did not give the bo Christians the canon. And this idea that somehow they threw out books, um, <laughs> this idea that they threw out books that didn't agree with their theology, that's also um, completely bogus. That is also completely bogus. And there's also an excellent video that James White has done on this issue called Abdullah al Andalusi and the Council of Nicaea, or Abdullah of London and the Council of Nicaea. Uh, so I recommend people checking that out because it really does um, deal with a lot of errors about the Council of Nicaea. The book of Matthew begins with the genealogy of Jesus. Why with the genealogy? Because it was told by the Hebrew scriptures that the Messiah would be from the tribe of Judah, from the seed of David, through Solomon. So this here is Matthew's attempt to comply with these requirements. The genealogy starts off on the wrong foot. Matthew 1.11 places Jeconiah in Jesus' lineage, which automatically disqualifies Jesus for being the Messiah. As it says in Jeremiah 20-24, Thus said the Lord, Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. For no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Big problem, Jesus can't be the Messiah. Why? Because Jeconiah's line was cursed. Even more, if the genealogy brought down in Matthew is Joseph's genealogy, 